I was working at a hospital for the poor. I saw cases after cases that I thought not only that the outskirts system was bad, but that the beliefs in hospitals were terrifying. I mean, one guy got shot by his friend who was drunk, and he's went on a bus from Acapulco all the way to Mexico City, holding his guts. And I said, how, how is it possible you got here? Why didn't he get treated over there? Poverty is much more complex than I'm physically ill. If you are with the most vulnerable, it opens you up and you're thinking, God, I'm spoiled. When Mar de Jade started, it started, as you've heard, as a clinic. It was never intended to be this resort retreat center. And so everything growing from there makes more sense within the ecosystem that we have now, because it's not really a business, it's a way of life, and it's something more powerful than just a business. Growing up in this environment where anything you dream is possible, you don't know how you're going to get there, but you're going to take the first step and you're going to trust that the next step is going to become apparent and that the right person is going to show up and that the right circumstances, because the direction is worth following. Personally, most inspiring parts of your story is how you all have integrated the community into the building of this, this, um, this retreat that you have. Mm -hmm. So it starts, well, it, it culminated in this, this nonprofit, the MDJ community project. So Angelica, can you, can you talk a little bit about the genesis of that, how it came to be and what all you all are now doing with that, with that project? Yes, absolutely. I mean, when Mar de Jade started, it started, as you've heard, as a clinic. I mean, it was never intended to be this master plan for a resort retreat center. And so everything growing from there makes more sense within the ecosystem that we have now, because this really be, it's not really a business, it's a way of life. And it's something that, you know, this, mm -hmm. this in communion between the land, the people, and what our efforts are, create something more powerful than just a business. And in that sense, um, the clinic that my mother ran for, you know, 25 years, offering free service for all the local farmers and fishermen and, and the community was the initial, the kind of the genesis of this. And then as she retired from medicine, we shifted our focus a bit more towards education and, um, you know, skill training for young people. So right now, what that looks like is a primary a preschool through middle school. Montessori Waldorf inspired uh, community school in Chacara, in the town where the retreat center is. And that school started in 2013, so 10 years ago. And we've grown steadily every year throughout uh, the multiplying our grades every year. So we have now 80 kids and uh, we scholarship all of the local kids to attend the school. And this was born out of a very personal need for educating my own children. So there's, there's also that involvement in that way. And then uh, simultaneously to that, we've had since 2008 an organic farm, because again, this kind of understanding of the land and what is healthy for us as in our bodies and for the earth is you know, coming to this point of self-sustainability and going towards the organic, non-toxic, growing our own food. And so we have this organic farm, we have the school, and then um, about five years ago, coming back to this sense of building everything ourselves, as my great grandmother, my mother's grandmother, uh, always inspired her to do. And bringing that into the ethos of Mar de Jade was, well, it was always there from the beginning. It's let's make it ourselves. We're in the middle of nowhere. We're in the boonies. We can't buy anything. And before free trade in Mexico, it was really hard to get, you know, a lot of imports and things like that. And so we would kind of make things ourselves. We had a carpenter who worked, his father worked with my grandfather in Mexico City. And he and his wife came to Mar de Jade uh, as a young man, and he worked with us, and he trained a lot of local men in carpentry. And they eventually, and they built everything at Mar de Jade, everything that's wood. So that same model and spirit, we actually transferred it to the farm in, in that location and created a trade school where we have young people from 18 to 29 who take a year-long trade workshop. It can be carpentry food processing, maintenance, uh, sewing, and we're opening now a bakery uh, and organic farming. 
And so this, this school allows, most of these kids have dropped out of middle school, high school. They have children to support by 18 or 19 uh, or other family members to support. So this is an opportunity to learn a skilled trade, finish their GED equivalent, and you know have a better opportunity at life than what their original circumstances presented them. So right now, those are the projects that we have going on. With Mar de Cade, it, it's kind of, you know, it runs in harmony and in synchrony synchronicity with um, the kind of retreat aspect portion of it, which has now become, you know, more business-like in the way, in the, in the logistics and the details and the, mm-hmm. the manner in that we conduct um, our relationship with our retreats and our, and our guests. We try to be more efficient in all of that, but at the same time, that <laughs> funds our community projects and, and a big portion of our revenue goes directly to funding all of our community projects, which, you know, impact around 120 students in total between the two educational projects. Plus we have, we employ around a hundred local staff. So we have kind of, you know, a small operation big for us, but it's, it's something that is just completely interwoven with the community and with the spirit of what we're doing. As I said, it's, it's a way of life beyond anything. What do you, what would you say is the, what is the charitable budget that it requires to run the school and the trade thing and the farm and all of those, all of those things on a, on a yearly basis, just to get a scope of what you all have created there. Well, the operating budget um, of the school is around, oh, you caught me off guard here with the numbers, but it's a I, part. Like, yeah, is it a I million? believe it's, is it a couple million. Um, no, it's, it's not even that much. It's around um, $300,000 a year, for mm-hmm. example, for the school. And at the trade school, our operating costs are of, t- of the teachers in each trade is, is lower than that. But the, it's more than the operating cost, the investment, you know, the, mm-hmm. because we've, we've really built up a lot of you know, capital investment in both projects. The land, uh, so we've purchased the land, we've, you know, put the infrastructure in, built the, the workshops and uh, did all of the, the equipment. equipment. Um, so we've kind of steadily been investing in this um, framework and in the buildings themselves uh, to house the school and house the trade school. In addition to the farm, which has also been, it was an abandoned piece of land. So the soil is really degraded. So nurturing the soil and kind of bringing organics into the midst of this agricultural space all around us where no one else was organic. And so all of, you know, of course, all of the plagues want to come and feed off the delicious bounty that's organic and not sprayed. So, you know, there's just been a lot of back work into building up, building everything up uh, way beyond the kind of annual operating budget of, of keeping the teachers employed and the, and the lights on. And you were educated, you went to university in the States, and so you were obviously exposed to the American dream. And I know when I grew up in small town, Alabama, I couldn't wait to get away from there, honestly. I never wanted to go back. (laughs) What is it that brought you back, Angelica? I mean, did you inherit your mom's activism by necessity trait, or what was it that lured you back to good old Chakala? Well, I also couldn't wait to get out. I mean, <laughs> I think it's a natural impulse as a young person to seek what's out there, right? Um, and so, you know, growing up, backtracking for a second, I, I went to the local school, which was one teacher for six grades, you know, slap on, slapping us with a ruler if we were misbehaving. And it was really like old little house on the prairie kind of thing, you know, but not so romantic. <laughs> and... Um, you know, it didn't really matter to me because I was surrounded by med students. I was translating since I was young at the clinic. I was going back and forth to the States. I had a lot of education outside of the classroom. Eventually, uh, I did a year abroad with our uh, meditation teacher, him and his wife. I went to, they offered to host me for a year in the, the Bay Area to go to school. And I jumped, I was 10 years old and I was like, take me, I'm going. Cause I knew there was something else out there that I need to experience. And it was fantastic. And I learned so much. It was, I was like, oh, this is what school is supposed to be like. All right, <laughs> I'm actually learning things. Um, and then after that, I was like, I need to go to a real school. I can't, I can't go back to village school. <laughs> so we, uh, with, through lots of sacrifice, uh, my mother was able to send me to a bilingual school in Puerto Vallarta and I'd finished my middle school and high school there. 
And then I went to college in the States. And there I was exposed to, you know, yes, the American dream, but also it was a really diverse college. I had people from, you know, all over the world that I made friends with. So I realized once I was a senior and trying to look at what was going to, what I was going to do, everyone was taking consulting jobs at, you know, McKinsey and Deloitte. And I was like, ooh. <laughs> so I, uh, I said, you know what, I'll go back home. I'll help my mom out. I'll, you know, help with the business and um, we'll see what happens. And maybe I'll go back and do a master's after that or something like that. And I came home and I never left. It's been, you know, almost 18 years. Um, <laughs> sometimes you think you're going one way and life is like, yeah, come on over here for a little bit. Um, but it's really been such a gift because I, you know, this is how I grew up. And so it comes naturally to me to believe in what we're doing and this way of life. And then I had my kids. And so, you know, for them, what a better place to grow up than on this little beach town. It's safe and beautiful in Mexico. And it's also a very big playground. You know, we didn't have a school for my kids. I was like, all right, let's build a school. And so growing up in this environment where anything you dream is possible, you don't know how you're going to get there, but you're going to take the first step and you're going to trust that the next step is going to become apparent and that the right person is going to show up and that the right circumstances because the direction is worth following. Mm. So I think I just kind of fell into that flow. <laughs> and and yeah, and, I, and I've been there since. And at this point, I'm more in charge of kind of the business admin aspect of things at the retreat center. And um, very much as well with the school, but we have people kind of running uh, the, we, we've, it's a big pie, <laughs> there's a lot going on. So we've managed to kind of split it up so that we're all, kind of focusing on different areas a little bit more. And Laura, when you look back at the last, I guess, nearly four decades of this project that has become Mar de Jade, what are you most proud of? My daughter. I was going to say, with the exception <laughs> of your daughter, with the exception of your daughter, what are you most proud of? I was drowning before she came back. I was like, I can't handle this place. No. I can't that, That's a given. It's a given that you're, you're proud of her. But just about the project itself, what are you most proud of? Oh, I'm most proud of the project. Well, occasionally I get a kid come up to me in the trade school. Says, do you remember me? you remember me? I went to the kids club at the clinic. Or there are kids that never thought of going to college who after a year of the trade school, and I invite college kids. We get like 10 college kids coming for four months or six or five and different things. And I make them teach what they learned in college, the kids that are barely going through the high school on Saturdays that we teach. And now there's like three or four in college and still have their job, but they take Saturday college. They were inspired by seeing other young people leading the workshops and teaching them what they learned in college. I said, you can't just have them work. I want you to give them theory. You gotta have the horse and the buggy. And the buggy's heavy because it's the theor theoretical part. The horse can go ahead and do things, but they have to learn to have a clear, like my daughter does, a clear picture of what are the immediate pieces, the later pieces, et cetera, so that they can actually become independent. If they're there, like just, to, so this is what I'm most proud of, is that by combining different levels of young people and then older people that come in and teach and are mentors, the kids open up their world immensely. They realize that they're not, they don't have to be either a radical cartel guy to get money or, uh, or I'm always going to be picking up boxes and putting them on a truck for peanuts. They suddenly get a solid sense of self-worth. And because I was a troubled youth and I see that, so, and I see this is the kind of school I would have wanted to go to in high school, you know, it took hands on. But then after I get my hands in the dough, tell me how I do it. What, what are the ingredients? How do I make it? How do I fix the machine? So all that part of the everyday reality mixed in with the influx of what are you here for? A simple, dignified life. You have to have ethics, yeah. you know? So I'm proud of kids that I see Managed to do the turn, not all of them, and some of them we lose. But I'm seeing more and more kids saying, Oh, gee, if I do this year, could then I go to college? Or I say that if they come work here, 
you can only work here if you finish high school. I don't want anybody that hasn't finished high school here. So, they, so like four kids who are going to high school, they, they were just stuck with washing dishes or doing menial work. I said, are you going to do that all your life? Uh-uh. I don't want anybody like that. I don't want losers. <laughs> so, get, so they're doing it, you know. So kind of the influence of a youth village and having the youth that um, – that gets gets the hang that we're not just there to teach a trade right. we're there to open hope uh create something hey so a lot of you all have been reaching out with your guest suggestions and look i appreciate it i do and to help make it easier for those guests to say yes to my invitation i need you to subscribe to this channel just hit the subscribe button below and that's literally the best way to help me get you that guest on my podcast. All right, thank you so much for helping out and back to the show. You grew up in, in, or at least you were born in Mexico City in La Condesa, which is where I am right now, coincidentally. So <laughs> tell me, what was it like growing up in this area, in Mexico City? Well, let me tell you, um, I actually have lived a very zigzag life. I grew up seven years in La Condesa, but in La Condesa between fighting parents that got divorced, father with the custody. So at some times I was in La Condesa with my father, at some times with my grandparents. Then my mother would take us off to Acapulco to the beach, and then we'd come back to La Condesa. And then at seven, we I spent seven years in Chicago from seven to 14. Then I went back to La Condesa at 14. And so I've had La Condesa all my growing up in the different stages. And from 20 to 30, it was fascinating to be in La Condesa before it became popular. <laughs> so uh, I think my um, the contrast between Mexico City and Chicago in neighborhoods filled with immigrants, Czechs, uh, Jews, uh, Puerto Ricans, Italians, everybody helping everybody. And my grandmother, an immigrant as well, gave me a view that when I would go back to La Condesa, I thought, why are these people so snobby? <laughs> why are these people treating the cook the way they treat her? Why are my relatives here? You know, I, I could I I understood the class system after having been raised in the conscious here by a grandmother immigrant who would help braceros when she didn't have papers, who would uh, who went through the depression, who went through World War II. My mother was first born there. She was the only one of six relatives that stayed in the States because she she was a radical and they were conservative. They all came back to Mexico in their fluffy little bubble and my grandmother stayed and became a tighter. So I had La Condesa, which at that time was like a very nice neighborhood for stable upper class families. And I had it as a young girl where um, Mexican hippie dumb and acting and excitement was happening. So it, it was delicious. Both cities, totally different. That's interesting. <laughs> so you mentioned the, the the depression, and I know a lot of people whose whose parents or grandparents experienced the depression. They they inherited this kind of frugality um, in general. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, was that your experience? And then in addition to that. What sorts of philosophies or ideologies did you pick up from your mother and, and, and grandmother? Well, not only my mother and grandmother, my grandmother um, was one of the, this affects all of my life. Having my grandmother's upbringing, I mean, the, the years I was lived with my grandmother, when my mother got fed up with me, she was very tough on me. And so I would go live with my grandmother. And my grandmother was a creative spirit that she see, she was brought up with very beautiful furniture. She find old piece and she upholstered. We say we want we want this done. She get us the tools to do it. We were eight, nine, ten years old. You know, her kids were the same age as my mother's kids, so they were both pretty attractive, active women, but feisty and alone. They did not like to be hemmed in, and so. But their kids were the focus, and I'm going to teach them everything so they can land on their feet. It was absolute independence. You know, it wasn't pampering and uh, you, nobody took you to school. You got there by yourself. You dressed yourself. Uh, you made the food for the family. But my grandmother always had and my mother always had everybody kid and every kid in the neighborhood was hungry coming over to eat. And they barely made a living. They weren't educated. You know, my grandmother got pregnant at 16, my mother at 17. So what did they know? You know, and uh, 
and whether they were working as waitress, telephone operator, translator, or court, whatever, the the spirit of sharing was always in our house. And that I learned from my grandmother. And uh, they and from my grandfather in Mexico, he was an old Spaniard that came at the time of the revolution as a Spaniard, 15-year-old, on a ship. He never changed his car his entire lifetime. <laughs> Cadillac that lasted 30 years, impeccable, never reupholstered. I mean, the reupholstered, never changed anything. All with, what am I doing for the next generation? He's got six buildings we're still all feuding about in Mexico City. Because he was, what is going on for the next generation? I got my first money to buy here for my grandpa. Mm. You know, I had got a penny. I was working as a doctor in Mexico City Hospital. You earned like peanuts, like you know, $500 a month. Um, so both grandparents instilled in me, they were feisty. Mm -hmm. My mother was feisty, my father was conservative. He was feisty in his own personal way. Mm -hmm. A lot of women, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, more the gentleman's life. But the grandparents who faced um, political social changes, they were more radical and they, they were independent. Mm -hmm. They were outliers. And I think they inherited that to me, you know. That's probably as a young person, I'm talking like teenage, you're starting to now think about, you know, what do I want to do when I grow up in a serious way? What was your understanding of success back then? How did you relate to success when you looked at the lives of your mother and your grandfather and your grandmother? You know, I didn't think of success as a teenager at all. I don't recall thinking of success. I thought, what brings me joy? And I was acting. I was acting. I dropped out of high school. And I, um, I mean, I didn't go back to high school till I was 24. I got into med school late. I was like six years older than most people in Mexico. But during those years, I did what I damn pleased. And in the States, it was the Beatles, Bob Dylan, you know, the Pops. And Mexico was the Pompadour hairdos and the finishing school. So I never learned anything anywhere but painting in the yard and writing poetry and reading uh, my favorite romantic novels and all this sort of stuff. So I had no sense. It was like I was in a dream and I went to LA to act and I was in place because I didn't like the interviewing in LA. They always asked me to take my blouse off because I'm the scene, the girl got the right. And I said, well, you know, more on that. I'm walking all the interviews. I walked out. It was very bucks me. And so I always was been trying to get a part of the Latino who was, you know, and I thought, that's not what it's about. So um, I we came to Mexico and, and I quickly found when I, at 20, I came back to Mexico. My grandfather was going to die, they told me. So I zoomed back to Mexico and uh, I hadn't seen him for about four years. He lived 15 years more. Oh, hallelujah. He was my mentor. And uh, I got into theater in Mexico. And it was really wonderful and it was wild and it was protest theater and it was surrealistic theater. But when I started meditating, I suddenly got surrounded by all the oddballs in Mexico that we didn't fit into any system. We weren't programmed. What, 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 you know, what, what led to the meditation interest? I mean, acting doesn't really, acting. No, how did that lead to meditation? Well, you know, I, I, I have come to believe that trust your, Trust who's in front of you and where they're shining the light, you know, um, because everything I've ever done that's important, I've had a messenger saying, come this way. And sometimes it's a deep connection and sometimes someone I just met said, come this way. So with the acting, uh, with the meditation, um, we we're doing protest theater and there is um, a, a French director called Khodorovsky. Um, who was doing um, very surrealistic movies in the theater play. And one of the actors was in our group. And she said, uh, I said to her, you know, I mean, I'm earning enough money on commercials. That's how I made money in Mexico, doing commercials, you know, soap commercials and all that sort of stuff. That uh, I want to go somewhere. I've never traveled anywhere. All my friends have gone on backpack to Europe. I, I, I want to go to Japan because... My brother is a karate teacher at the university, and I want to learn, you know, he's always, oh, Japan. So she said, oh, come to the center um, to meet this teacher, and he can tell you where to go. So he was the first Rinzai Zen monk to step in Japan. Nohodorovsky, this theater producer, brought him to, Japan, to Mexico. He didn't like the environment in the U.S. He ended up in Mexico. 
opening up a little Zendo. And that's the one where he was filled with a lot of the radical people. I myself never experienced the 68 uh, trauma of the mowdown of students in the plaza of Socalo in Mexico City. But being surrounded by friends who all had a purpose suddenly made me feel like, wake up, wake up, what are you doing? You know, what are you doing? And a, a, a fellow I fell in love with was a kind of a very passionate, diehard Marxist, said, What are you doing for your country? Like, how many people are you reaching with Peter? Why don't you become a doctor? And of course, I had such a crush on him. He, that he thought, literally said that. Why don't you become a doctor? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Why don't you, why don't you become a doctor? To you, you specifically or to the group? No, to me. To me. He knew I had a crush on him. So, and I thought, what, what is this message? I am totally in another world. I am in painting, poetry, and art. <laughs> I skipped biochemistry in high school. <laughs> I couldn't do calculus. I barely understood algebra. I was always a slow learner because I was ch switching languages as a kid. I mean, I didn't have a good foundation in, in that area. And, but then as I heard how passionate he was, about creating laboratories in Oaxaca and here and protesting by bringing a band of Zapotecan kids to play in the presidency. And they opened the doors for the tribe to talk to the president about the dam they were going to destroy the village. They were always doing schemes to protest. They were safer than getting shot down. You know what I mean? You Bringing in the people. And I was just fascinated because it was a it was a real live theater of the drama going on around me. It wasn't written by a person. It was happening. And, um, it, you know, we both went uh, our own ways, but I really understood that he left in me a precious gift because by going into medicine after meditation and after my years of, um, kind of having my own freedom to see what I wanted to do in my heart would really fill me with joy. I um, also be becoming I a doctor be... will require you to finish high school, enroll in college, take the MCAT or whatever that's called, go to medical school. That's not a passive, you know, track. You'd have to be very well, intentional. It's probably not that cheap. No, cheap in Mexico it was. In Mexico, med school at the best university in Mexico is La Unam. And it was like $200 a year. I didn't have money for books. Back then it was all books. And a book would cost like, you know, huge amounts. You know, one weekend of doing a Palmolive commercial, you know, my father would give me a little passion. And my grandpa was put, gave me a house in La Condesa and put food on. Always brought me a big bag of food every week because I was a bit proud. And he said, Do you need anything? My grandpa would say, No, I don't. <laughs> so, but the intention and meditation of just staring at the floor and then the staring at the floor with hardly any instruction, unlike the Buddhist teachers we have now, they give you all this long, and me myself was the long verbal saying, the floor teacher, the floor teacher. I had enormous emotional catharsis and I was able to concentrate. And so when I decided to pick up learning, I was voracious about the learning. I was very detailed about it, you know, because I felt I didn't have a background. So I made the double effort and used the meditation as a tool of concentration. So when you were going through medical school, obviously you were envisioning, okay, how am I going to serve as a doctor? What was your, what was that vision like um, for yourself? Hmm. Well, I had, um, I had an acupuncture background and I had a background of fasting on juices and, you know, trying the things that were supposed to be alternative to medicine way before I got into medicine. So when I began working on the wards, I would get scolded for, uh, a friend of mine reminded me for asking, what do you eat? <laughs> what happened to you when this began? I would get scolded for being uh, too extensive with my questionnaire. You know, let's stick out your tongue. Let's see the color. <laughs> so um, I really was molded by what you call diagnosis by exclusion. I thought being a doctor was dealing with material reality. That was real. Acting was a make-believe world of fantasy, and it wasn't going to uh, 
pardon me, it wasn't going to really affect anybody except little um, radical people that could see the injustice. It was, it was just a little thin cap there. But as a doctor, I could really, I had this fantasy as I was going to touch material reality and what is, not what I imagined, you know, having been a teenager with a great imagination and kind of lived in my own dream world, I'll tell you the truth, because every, I went over there, I was too, too conservative. I came here, I was too liberal and fit. And so as a doctor, I would fit, <laughs> you know, and I began to see that the institutions were cost benefit cost benefit. The bottom line is you can't spend that much time with anybody. The bottom line is the new director of the hospital hasn't operated in 20 years. He's been running a chemical company and he's going to operate on my patient who is don't let him operate. <laughs> so I was getting in trouble a lot. You know, me and my best friend were kind of both bicultural in school. And we would really get attached to the stories of the people. And what really influenced me is that I would see that the people that came in and they were very kind of, there was some humility of spirit that was not, um, that was what the general hospitals had. Um, we're coming from the countryside and we were coming with a fight for life that was so hurting. I mean, one guy got shot in the plaza, in the square of the plaza by his friend who was drunk. And he went on a bus from Acapulco all the way to Mexico City, holding his guts. Luckily, it wasn't a main artery. And I said, how, how is it possible you got here? And his wife was waiting to I knew I couldn't pass out. I passed out of that. And I got surgery. And I don't, and another woman, you know. I, well, I saw cases after cases that I thought, what is, why didn't he get treated over there? Or why didn't she get treated in Michoacan? How could this woman get to this level of cancer without anybody intervening? And the truth is that people were, it wasn't so, it was not only that the outskirt system was bad, but that the beliefs in hospitals were terrifying. You go there to die. Well, obviously, if you go at the very end of something, you die. You know, So people didn't want to go to hospitals, and I did see a lot of people. And it, what impacted me was the courage people had and the kindness and the gratitude and i was working at a hospital that was for the poor it wasn't a private practice where they're demanding this and this and that and they have money to do everything you know so i thought to myself oh, i'm going to go work out and i had two things that were kind of contradictory i wanted to go out and work for the poor and not necessarily categorizing poor just the money Yes, poor money, the great richness and dignity and generosity and humor and forbearance. You know, that's at least the impression I got in my 20s of these people. But on the other hand, I am not going to work for a government institution. And that's the only thing that's out there. I go out and the first one I worked for didn't have running water, didn't have light, was all rusted. I'm supposed to deliver babies with in the dark. I rented a house and then they accused me of private practice. I rented a house by myself with my little, little salary with electricity and running water. And I got all kinds of problems by the health department. Why was I running? I said, come look at the shop you send me to. You know, I'm still looking at very serious problems. People with my chitty wounds, people delivering with, you know, bring a bucket of water or something. So I thought I'm not working for an institution. And right from there, my first time I went out to Yucatan, and I was on a beach that was beautiful. I said, I gotta live on a beach. But out here, and that was before Cancun and, and Playa del Carmen. I mean, this was in 79. And so um, I went and I thought, ah, it was a matter of fact, I met a drummer, a US drummer and a Mexican politician. And the three of us were gonna do this project. He was gonna get the land and we were gonna run this program. And um, Playa del Carmen was, had just a few hammocks on it. You know, well, we paid 50 pesos to see if I have. Anyway, I said, here, I want to I wanna work with rural people, but I don't want to work for an institution, so I have no idea what I'm going to make money out of. Did you recognize, even now looking back, any of the, any of the skills that you learned as an actor or going through that process that were now serving you well as this young upstart doctor in the Yucatan? Did, was there any correlation between what you did as an actor? And that? That's an interesting question, Light. 
I think uh, you learn on stage to listen and improvisation and react. You know? And I think that was something uh, that was very useful because I had always an outpour of, I just talked to a doctor this morning about it. She's kind of in the same situation I was 20 years ago. She said, I'm, I'm getting burnt from all this that I'm hearing. And being able to listen and then being able to guide the person back to themselves, as my daughter says about school and kids, you know, I've learned that from her and, and her ability to raise kids with that guide them back to themselves. I actually inadvertently with acting would guide the person back to, well, this is what you can do. You know, this is what can you do about this, 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 or that? What feels good to you? What do you want to do? And I had to really break it down to a very simple language. You know, um, what it means to live uh, with advanced diabetes you know, like a pump of the sugar, da da da, hypertension. I had to put it all in metaphors of the farming community. And the acting part later, I learned to use in trauma to release people. We would have them enact being the powerful one when they had been the vulnerable one in clinic. Because when I had the clinic here, I had the time to, I mean, there was a lot to do, deal with all the patients. The medical students, the residents, and half understood the language. I'd had to go through all the charts. So I would pass them on and train my health workers uh, into kind of psychodrama, reevaluation counseling, and where if you had been raped, then you had to put the arms around someone. I had to burst your arms and say, nobody's touching me that I don't want to touch me. And that was much more effective than hours of talk, you know? The physical sensation of I'm powerful enough to buck anybody up that I don't want to touch me. Or I can push my mother-in-law out of the door because she keeps opening the curtain every time my father and I make love. <laughs> my father, her husband and her, the mother-in-law pushed, would open the curtain to the room, you know. I had all kinds of weird cases where I said, okay, do what you really hear now. Do what you really want to do with your mother-in-law. I know because of my mother and we're acting, we're playing. Just play at it. She, I was the mother-in-law. She almost pushed me out of the balcony. <laughs> and I said, do you still live there? I didn't see her. Are you still living with your mother-in-law? No, I moved out. Because he wouldn't leave his mama. I moved out, and he moved in after me. So a little acting went much better than the actual therapy, which is a turtle, if it's not a dinosaur, you know. So, yeah, I think that was, and I still is my love of psychodrama. Yeah. Okay. So you eventually ended up in Chakala, which is in Nayarit. Mm -hmm. um, you had a clinic and you also have this retreat center. So I'm not sure if you went there to open a retreat center and you did a clinic on the side or you opened a clinic and the retreat center just kind of happened. Give us a little bit of a montage of how that all came to be. You know, I think when you're in love with um, helping, not because I'm a good person, because as I helped, I really got helped. I mean, the, the, the people that were suffering so much more than I had suffered in my life. I mean, I had my wounds, you know, my wounds from my mother, from my father, abandonment issues. My mother was really tough. There was no, I was whack whack if you didn't do something. And I was brought up in a kind of like bizarre group of adults that, you didn't you have to be on your toes to see what was next kind of and you know uh as feisty as they were they were kind of hard on the kids and on the other side it was the opposite with father and grandpa so the um the coming here was a bit like somebody i met in yucatan said come visit nayarit and uh i fell in love with the jungle the guy in the beach next door is telling that I saw it. So I didn't really know what I was going to live off of. My first challenge was I walked onto this road, it was bumpy in a you know, 45 minute ride. I saw the beach and I said, oh, this is it. This is it. Because I was always into cooking. I was always into experimenting in my youth with juice fasting and that kind of thing. And I thought, well, what am I going to do here? And as I, as I said, this is it. And things started working on and I invited 
people to join me because I didn't have the money to buy the land. And I figured I'll go to the U.S. and work six months, come back. You know. How, how were you uh, making money, by the way, off the rural poor? Were they like giving you fish or whatever they were out catching that day to pay you for their services? Or <laughs> how, how did it work? I think, <laughs> well, it worked. Yeah, I, I often got roosters and I put them on the back of my truck <laughs> in a car. The rooster was there by the time I come home because they didn't know to give it air. <laughs> Roosters, chickens, fish. But I actually never asked for payment. And I actually never wore a white robe. And I actually found out um, that they didn't uh, quite like allopathic medicine. And the fact that I pressed and touched their back, their side, their pain, it was more local curandera, you know. They, they looked at me more like la señora de las agujas, or the lady of the needles. They had never seen acupuncture. So they thought I was, it was some people thought I was voodoo and I had, I could put evil spells. Other people came to take away evil spells. And I quickly realized that nobody, when, when I really saw a, something I did not want to um, deal acupuncture because it wasn't enough. I mean, there was somebody that really made a captive pearl or whatever because they had a, huge they come down from the mountain with 210 blood pressure over 110 i knew that was a person was ready for a cerebral accident and they didn't have the money to sustain it that's when and i found cancer in the paps and i began to see things that needed tuberculosis resistant medicine which there wasn't any in mexico i again the same people that introduced me to chakala was a danish guy and his norwegian girlfriend went off to San Francisco and I said, God, I'm going to starve to death here. I can't charge anybody. I said, you can't charge anybody a penny. Come up to San Francisco and work. We'll get you work. So I went up and stayed at their house in San Francisco. So I said, these are, it's peculiar because you know how I met them. They came to the village, the Mayan village where I was working because they heard they were somebody with needles and he was having a headache every time he had an orgasm and they were all very, both of them were very concerned. I put needles on them, <laughs> the headaches went away. And well, we, and then they were working for National Geographic, so they took me everywhere on adventures because I was a little too timid to explore the Lacandon jungle and both ways on my own, you know. And then they led me here, then they led me to San Francisco. So I think people in your life come for very specific reasons and not always what you think they come mm. for. It's to open up a path of, uh, of where the true self is, where the true reality is. I love that. And what, what, what assumptions had you made about working in the rural poor, that, poor that, you, that turned out to be maybe not the case? Oh, I thought everybody was really noble. Like the people I saw in the hospital it turned out to be a lot of real good people. A lot of really, uh, uh, I mean, I was just shocked at the amount of, um, disrespect for women and children mm -hmm. you know uh i was shocked at uh, the betrayal of certain people in the village against the whole town i was shocked what, at, what would their uh, motivation be was, was it just kind of like this sort of machismo or is it something deeper than that was it like a narco type of thing what, 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 what? no back then there was no narco i mean there was always selling marijuana mm. fields you know there were marijuana fields but even the governor allowed it because a, a farmer could earn a lot of money from connect that as a marijuana field and everybody was dealing marijuana but uh there was not you know crack coke right. like that, all this so it's like ego egotistical type of a thing well what is it that makes people corrupt anywhere what is it makes people adore power possessions and things mm -hmm. you know they give more reality to things than being you know, what do you do? we all know that it's very ephemeral and it's the sense of self being worthy because I have this and I have that and, you know, and my family is, it's this my thing. It's this ego concentration of the my, you know, you know. And so you end up with people that, um, and they're the people that are sheep. They have to follow the leader or they get in trouble. And also, recognizing the history of colonialism in Mexico and how that shapes societies and pits, you know, people against each other and especially those with a little bit more um, 
this whole area where Mar de Jades used to be an enormous plantation and this not that far back. And the stories that some of the older folks will tell about, you know, going against the foreman or, you know, et cetera, it becomes very dangerous. The foremen were worse than the owners. The owners didn't even leave here. They would hang people in Las Vadas from trees mm -hmm. that they took coconut and sold it to somebody. Or if young men talked back and said, I don't want to do that, they, they kill him. And I had a night guard, but you were, she remembers him, the Tacuerdas, see, played the violin and the thing. And he remembered the plaza where people were hung from the trees. Mm -hmm. And the poor men were people that were had enough of a mean streak to go against their own, you know. And that that was the um, and I think it's kind of an inherited thing when you think that you have to subdue the next generation through violence, right? Because don't get in trouble with the foreman if you don't. You know? yeah. And I found that when she went to school, the the teacher would hit the kids. I said, no, she's going to be afraid to go to school. I just use it to scare them. And you know what the mother said to me? If you don't hit her, she's not going to learn respect. And she'll hit you one day. She hasn't hit me yet. <laughs> she tells her, mom, get back. <laughs> I remember from the orientation of the land that in the early, early days, there was this like one room where anytime you went into that room, you came out pregnant. And anyway, <laughs> Ange Angelica comes onto the scene, right? And and you're now you're now a new mom, and you're in this this rural area, and you're not making a whole lot of money. Obviously, being a mom sort of shifts things a little bit, where you gotta you have to provide for your family while you're doing all these other things. So talk a little bit about that transition as a mother while being an activist, while wanting to be on this mission, while inviting people to come and contribute to the development of Mar de Jade. You know, I wasn't on purpose an activist. Only when a situation came up that I found unjust would I act. And a lot of times it was more the one-on-one -on -one situation. And I remember when I was pregnant with Angelica, I never lacked food. Everybody brought me food. We didn't have electricity. There was no bills to pay. I basically learned to live without money until practically the last month where I went back to the States to deliver her because I never even checked myself out. I didn't know if she was a boy or a girl. I kept saying, I hope it's a boy. But I kept seeing patients. And I remember one patient that had urinary guy that had urinary incontinence, a large prostate problem. And he was really suffering. He was a tourist. He was an older man. And uh, he was in such pain and it was so hard to get out. And there was no, so they brought him to me. And I really needled him to death to just create, you know, urinary, help with the incontinence. He began urinating. And he said, you know what? You're having a girl. I said, yeah, why? The girl, you're having a girl because the world needs more women like you. And she's like, she's coming. And I, I didn't have an ultrasound. I had the guy tell me, you're having a girl. <laughs> Because the world needs women that care, you know, and he was right. <laughs> he was right. But no, and so, you know, then um, during the whole pregnancy, I practically lived with, without a penny. I lived in a little, little cabin, the, the pregnancy cabin. We had to, I, I can't even remember, we had to boil the water. I had kerosene lamps. I had mosquito nets over the bed. I once had a big snake hanging over with my big belly like this. And I called the one gardener that came. I said, God, get rid of the snake. He said, yeah, get rid of the snake. It's like, it's over my child's belt. Yeah. And then he finally got rid of the snake. And the next day there were bats. So the snake was there to eat the bats. <laughs> so I was always learning. <laughs> How do you live in the wilderness? The whole time, I always have food. All the time. They bring me fish. They bring me pozole. They bring me this. And then... Uh, was it before the pregnancy? I said, this place doesn't need me. My country needs me. Where I'm at needs me. It's not even my country. It's these people need me. I don't care what country it is. These people need me. And I need them. Did anyone try to talk you out of what you were trying to do and say you're, you know, you're 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 wasting your talent. You should be making way more money. We're all doing so well, you know. What what are you doing down there? Exactly. How did you know? <laughs> My father was, what are you doing out in the middle of nowhere? You could be doing a residency in Mexico City. You have a house. What are you doing out there? 
I said, and my mother was the same thing. Come to the U.S. and get your U.S. license. You know, you're not going to face uh, hardship and poverty where you're at. You're not going to, you're not going to make it. What is wrong with you? You know, and I, I had everybody. And even, uh, hey, what, would, from, what would you say in, in response or, or to say anything? Well, I don't recall that I ever, I, that I could even retort to them. I'd say, yeah, you've got a point there, but, you know, I'm really okay where I'm at. It's good where I'm at right now. Maybe someday I'll leave here in a few years, but I have something to learn here and I don't know what it is. And I've been in cities and I know I don't want to learn there. I don't want to be hemmed in by institutions and by the social society around me. And here I feel kind of a freedom I've never felt before. Mm. And also, I also talk a lot of healing. People think, oh, what a good person, you're an angel, I'm an angel. I had a lot of wounds that I had to heal. There were a lot of confusion in my heart. And that I had a venue through love to care for people. And so it became much more important than having a mate than having a house with kids. And, you know, all that other lifestyle was not, it just didn't attract me. Yeah. And Angelica, what do you remember in as you were a young kid in those early days of Mar de Jade, as it, everything was sort of, sort of coming together? Well, it was, I mean, it was incredible because we didn't have electricity. We didn't have running water. You know, my, I don't have a TV. I, I, did, I remember the first time I saw a TV, I must have been like 10 or 11. And I was like, what is this sorcery? And we just <laughs> climbed trees and, you know, swim. And, and I grew up, I'm an only child, but I grew up surrounded by kids. It was a very small community. And also, you know, my mother was la doctora, the doctor in town. And so I would be, I remember one time a man came in late at night with a huge gash across his leg. And there was no one else but me and her. So she's like, all right, you hold it together. I'm going to suture it. So, you know, it was always um, kind of peeking into this adult world of service and also getting a chance to be a kid in nature and you know, play around and be connected in that way to my environment. And you all, you, you, you were requested by this Sufi group to, for them to come there and, 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 and have a retreat. Was that when it officially sort of became a retreat center? It stopped being just a home where people would come and visit and, and, and help out on the land and it became like a actual business. I wouldn't say it ever became a business or <laughs> officially a retreat center. <laughs> I didn't know for 30 years how many tomatoes came in and how many tomatoes went out. I mean, it was the least. It just sort of handled itself, even in crisis time. I mean, I just really believe that when you're on, when you're on the path of searching, when you face the abysses in your life, and there's something that happens that everything helps you to do it. You're not doing it. Like art, you know, sometimes people say, I didn't write it or I didn't paint it or I didn't compose it. Some energy, something bigger than me helped me do this. And I don't know what it is, but I want to cultivate it. Mm. So when I came here, I would go to the States, make a few bucks, bring medicines down on a truck. She and I were always driving with a toddler in a truck, you know, all the way from San Francisco, driving down, getting to Sinaloa, Sinaloa, dangerous spots, coming here. But having um, that point, somebody said, you know, why don't you take med students? I said, no, med students won't survive here. I have nothing here to offer. Instance, you know, I, a lot of it has to do with personal relationship. If I can't offer people, I offer them my personal support through whatever they're going through. Because I remember one guy that couldn't get more than he was dying of cancer and he was in agony and the, the acupuncture wasn't helping. And da da da. And I remember just sitting and meditating with him. And when I went to retreat, I did move from the pain in my knees thinking of him. And the moment I accepted the pain, it disappeared. Mm. So there was, I learned from the patients. He had no way out of his condition. A lot of people have no way out of their condition. You know, what do I need? Unhealthy, a beautiful kid, just growing up in nature. The retreat happened on their own. I went and Sufi danced because I remember, I don't know who I'm dancing. And I shared some pictures of where I lived and immediately 
Like, oh, can we have a retreat there? I said, I don't know. They like, have a dirt floor. There's no electricity. They would. I don't know how many people. They would take turns down. doing the dishes. It was more like a a camp. <laughs> And everybody, the med students were 10 to 15. They'd clean, they'd get the banyo ground, the blues, they would come, they would learn. They would learn, interview a person, not just his body, his whole life. Mm -hmm. Where is his, poverty is much more complex than I'm physically ill. It's, I, they're throwing me out of my house, my kid's in jail. Uh, you know, I don't have money for something. How do you, I can't eat this stuff because I don't, I don't even know how to plant it. So it really opens you up. If you are with the most vulnerable, it opens you up and you start thinking, God, are we spoiled? For God's sakes, look at these people serve. I mean, and it happened on its own because I've come to a point, not that I understood it then. I didn't understand where the hell I was going and how it was going to happen. And I had no strategic plans and I had no master plan. And I didn't even imagine this place. People say, oh, what a visionary. First of all, I'm half blind. I was always my half hit. <laughs> and I lived in a dream world. So it wasn't a visionary. Little by little, responding to what was happening, it started to grow. And responding to people as people, not as my clients, not as the instant. Now we get it. Now we're going the full circle. We've got to keep track of what we're doing because it's too much. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got to have software systems and reservation systems. We used to write it all by hand or uh, call up and say, yeah, you're welcome to come. And the check would come after they left, you know. And at the clinic, there was no phone lines. But I mean, just let it all happen. Get out of the way. And let, if you have the love of beauty and harmony and creativity and compassion and the whole pot of ingredients going on because you're being stimulated to respond to life, but then it happens on its own. I am always like awed. I'm thinking of someone that I haven't talked to for four or five years and they call me. Or I, I, I just, this group, a young man is a really wild card that uh, plants mushrooms and I yeah, couldn't get a hold of them. The mushrooms, growing around mushrooms is important. He shows up, so, ah, so I, 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 so he's coming. And so I think um, it's just such a symphony yeah. of people here that come and so many that want to help that it gives me absolute trust in humanity in spite of the contradictions and the paradoxes of the ugly people that are still so wounded that they have to wound someone in order to be someone you know that they have to conquer to be someone you don't conquer anybody for god's sakes you're gone in a second hey really quickly if you like this content or if you don't like it let me know down in the comments because your likes and comments are going to help me learn what you want more of. And then that way I can keep bringing you the good stuff. All right. Thanks so much for your feedback and back to the show. And if you could go yeah. back to young 25, 26 year old Laura finishing up medical school and give her some words of wisdom in one of her dreams, what would that, what would hmm. that look like? Knowing what's coming ahead. Oh, <laughs> that's the mystery. <laughs> you don't ever know what's coming ahead. You think you want that and you end up with this and you're much better off for it. You know, I would say to myself, prepare for a few lifetimes in hell, but don't forget heaven. <laughs> Heaven's always right in the person you have in front of you. Even if he looks like the worst person in the world, look at what's good in them. Mm, Forgive people. That's beautiful. Forgive people everything. They don't mean that cruelty. They're really screwed up when they're that cruel. They've got a lot of insecurity, a lot of pain. And I think I would have warned me that it wasn't going to be uh, without falling into deep emptiness and solitude and despair. And okay, do it. Don't. Don't be afraid of falling. And I tell that to the kids now. Don't be afraid of falling. There's always getting up again. There's always something new beyond your loss. Don't nourish whatever hurts you. Mm -hmm. Nourish what gives you hope. You know, so that's kind of what would I tell myself? Now I look back and I see all the time, what is it that allows any human being to work um, 
with the vulnerable. It's their own vulnerability. Be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Don't put such a hard core around your heart and your social programming. Cast it out. You can't be free to you. Cast out all the programming. Society has got a really toxic programming in these modern times. You know, it's about getting, succeeding, competing. Mm -hmm. Forget that. We're no longer rangers. I, my one beautiful thing is that uh, I love it. I just recently I heard it. Ubuntu. There was an anthropologist in Africa. Have you heard mm -hmm. of it? But tell tell the listener what that, what that means. Ubuntu is anthropologist, as I recall the stories in an African village with a whole bunch of kids that he wants them to learn. You know, the competitive sports, and he puts a basket full of fruit under a tree, and he says, "When I blow the whistle, the first one to get there." is going to eat all the fruit and when he blows the whistle much to his surprise all these kids hand in hand like 15 kids walk toward the basket and share the fruit and they're saying ubuntu ubuntu so when he says what is ubuntu if i eat everybody eats mm. this is the this is the heart this is a human heart real heart a light heart the like everyday heart you know, it's, and it's there. Yeah. So I, I, um, well, we, we call that primitive, right? <laughs> the irony. I have a retreat coming up at Mar de Jade over the new year. And I've been doing those maybe every couple of years or so. So that's an opportunity for people to come and experience what you all have created. Mm -hmm. But if someone can't make it to that retreat for whatever reason, is there another way for them to come and have a direct experience at Mar de Jade and check out the farm and the trade school and all the wonderful things that you all have created. And I know there's opportunities to volunteer as well, but just talk a little bit about how people can, can experience what you've created. Uh, Laura. Absolutely. Well, sorry, you know, Angelica. Go ahead. Angelica. Go ahead, Angelica. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's so many ways to visit Mar de Jade and we really like to think of it as kind of like this coming home, right? So even mm -hmm. if you're coming for the first time or you're returning, you're coming home and there's so many ways to connect so you can come to a retreat like yours which is a fantastic retreat i've witnessed it and i think it's wonderful i encourage everyone to join and also there we host about 80 retreats a year so this is really kind of the what we've gotten into is hosting retreats and we have um, all the conditions for that to be a smooth beautiful process and so you can join any retreat you could also just come on your own you can come by yourself you can come with a friend you know partner um, and just hang out and visit the projects, um, or just hang out on the beach and do some, you know, hiking and some yoga. And also you can come volunteer. And so in the volunteering, you can participate at the trade school and the organic farm, learn Spanish, and you can stay that stay for a week or if you want, you know, a few months. So it's an opportunity to really dip your toes into the community, get your Spanish kind of, you know, up and um and experience it from a different perspective beautiful and i'd like to add that the real dream at the farm is a residential meditation yoga uh with periods of working with the kids mm -hmm. and we're setting up that people can come for a week or two i just had a woman who's had 40 years of a um, gluten-free bakery in oregon wanting to come show us how to do gluten-free. She's the one that's criticizing him that gluten-free desserts are not up to par. I said, I know we've got a very standard Mexican baker who throws tons of this. So she's coming. I have a woman who has won the James Beard Award chef in a group in Oregon who wants to go today to see the farm because she wants to come and learn and teach, learn Mexican food and teach Haitian food. So people, particularly, everybody has a talent that they can share. And this is very vital, what we were talking about, volunteering. The REITs are very low to volunteer. You can stay at the farm. You can stay here a week before your retreat, a week after. Because it really opens the heart of the one who thinks he's giving. It really, you, I, I want to very quickly tell you, um, I, I saw an interview of a woman that came out of, in one of the southern states with a very bigoted where there's a lot of white supremacy mm -hmm. and she was advocating and creating programs to get people out of white supremacy and when the interviewer asked her how did she make the turn she said 
Well, I got out of this little town into a big city, and I realized what I taught, what I was taught was a matter of fact of life was not at all. It was a really hideous thing. It wasn't until I lived in Detroit, I can't remember where she lived, that I suddenly realized the world was much bigger than the mentality in the town I lived. And it's, I have to do, do that for others because it's totally uncalled for. And so, I mean, this is kind of the essence of what we're doing, you know. Open up, when volunteers come, the world opens up to people because what they thought was absolute reality turns out it's bigger than that. You don't have to fit into that mold. You can fit into things that are more kind or empathetic and more productive. Mm. You know? And what's the website? Mardejade.com. The website of the... <laughs> it's all, it? You can all find it on mardejade.com. Mardejade means sea of jade in Spanish. So um, that's M-A-R-D-E-J-A-D-E.com. <laughs> Is it is the is the is the little uh, C there called Mardahade, or you guys just no. came up with that name for it? I dreamt you it. You dreamt it. I believe in dreams. So you woke yeah. up and you're like Mardahade. That's the name. That's it. No, I, I was in sticks, no water, mud around me, dust around me, snakes around me, and I had a dream that the ocean was JJ green. And then I looked around and there were there was not a lot, not just a few huts there. There were little red huts all over the place. And I was out on one place with a bunch of trees flowering. And I had white hair and I lied down. I assumed to die with a great joy of being part of these flowers and fruits. And I woke up and I said, Oh my God. I said to my sister, I drank the ocean so sparkling jade. And then I got to be really old and everything was flowering. And Maybe this should be Mara de Jade. I thought, it's too sounds too corny. No, she said, I like it, I like it. <laughs> and I was reading an Aztec book of the value of jade. In Aztec, was in women, it was the passion of their heart for the hurt. And in men, it was the courage. They put a disc. So simultaneously, something cued me off. And in the Orient, jade is, is a stone that is hard but can be molded softly mm. so the the hardness of life and the softness and you know the strength and the vulnerability and the courage and the passion you know the, the symbolism jived and it somehow it was not my dream and it was the dream that I thought, wow what is this what is this ocean like that so that's why <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that story. I think that's a really great way to wrap it up. And um, I highly encourage everyone to go to the website and see if there's anything that intrigues you to come and visit. And like, like Angelica said, you can just come on your own. And in the meantime, I look forward to reconnecting with you all in person um, at, in December. Look forward to seeing you. Well, wonderful to see you. Yeah. And your wonderful retreat that always brings joy and light. And maybe you don't have to wait till December and come volunteer in the projects <laughs> before then. There you go. Thank you all so much. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, you're, you're a stone throw away. If you like that video, you're going to love the next one. Click this thumbnail right here, and I'll see you over there.